In this video, I'm going to see if I can get our current build to run the ZX80 ROM as is. That is, completely unmodified. The wire side has turned into a bit of a rat's nest as well, with blue wires representing address lines, red representing data lines, and black for the control signals. This is actually a bit more disordered than necessary, because I've kept all the circuitry as I've gone along. Often, when I want to add a new feature, I'll leave in the old circuit and install jumpers to enable the new circuit as well. This lets me jump between the old and new configurations, and this makes debugging a lot easier. Before installing the ZX80 ROM, Ulster Clive and his team had one more trick up their sleeve that we need to go over. In the last video, we looked at using halt in the display file. Both the program counter and refresh counter would count up until they hit the halt instruction. Then, the program counter would stop, but the refresh counter would keep on going. By carefully controlling the initial value in the refresh register to be df hexadecimal, that meant that bit 6 of the refresh address was going low right at about the time we needed to generate an interrupt and exit halt. The Z80 has two interrupts, the non-maskable interrupt and the regular software controllable interrupt. When a non-maskable interrupt occurs, the value in the program counter is pushed to the stack and the CPU starts executing a service routine located at 66 hexadecimal. The regular interrupt has three modes and in mode one, it again pushes the value of the program counter onto the stack and starts executing code from location 38 hexadecimal. What this means now is that the first part of our reference scan line is done by the display file and the halt instruction, while the second part of the reference scan line is actually the interrupt service routine. This is the exact code for the interrupt service routine for both the ZX80 and ZX81, both of which use mode 1 interrupt. Let's go over it in more detail. I've analyzed it here with clock cycles included. We have 32 no ops, which come from the display file or the halt instruction, and these take 128 clock cycles. Then we have to account for the halt instruction itself, halt exit, and interrupt, which take up 21 clock cycles. The C register contains the number of scan lines remaining for the current row of text. Deck C is the instruction immediately after interrupt acknowledge. If we haven't completed eight lines for the current row, then we jump down to location 45 hex. We pop DE and remove and discard the return address from the stack. We need to skip five clock cycles here, and the return Z instruction is just to fill space. Next, we jump to location 41 hexadecimal. We move DD into the refresh register. We enable interrupts. Then we jump back to our display file. If we've already done the bottom scan line for the current row of text, then we don't perform the jump at location 39. We pop HL, which starts us at the next row of text in the display file. We decrement B, which initially contains the value 24, which is the total number of rows of text. If we're at the bottom of the screen, then we just return to the calling program. Otherwise, we set the C register to be 8, copy DD into the refresh register, enable interrupts, and jump back to the next row of text in our display file. Let's quickly compare this to our reference scan line when we use calls in the display file. We have our 32 no ops and then the call instruction. We assert horizontal sync, decrement B, then deassert horizontal sync. So why isn't there any mention of horizontal sync in the ZX80 and ZX81 interrupt service routine? We know it's supposed to occur in this period, so how's it being done? Well, this was also Clive's next big trick. I want to go back to our setup from the last video. As we slowly approach the interrupt signal here, we can see the refresh register just rolled over to 80 hexadecimal. So we've asserted the interrupt signal shortly after that. Now we can see that this third led in from the left is turned on, but I haven't labeled this so far. This green LED actually represents the IO rec signal. You may have also noticed that the M1 cycle is active. This, it turns out, is actually part of the interrupt acknowledge cycle. 
We can see it here on the right hand side of the diagram when both M1 and IO rec are low. This is actually mainly used in interrupt mode 0, which we're not using, but it's still present in the current interrupt mode. As we've already seen, Old Cyclivanese team are more than happy to use Z80 features in a way that they weren't exactly designed to be used. We know that after we've exited HALT, we enter the interrupt acknowledge sequence, which means we'll get this one shot of IO rec for about one clock cycle. And the Z80 in particular uses this to generate the horizontal sync signal. On the schematic diagram, we have this set of three flip flops, which converts this IO rec signal that occurs during interrupt acknowledge and generates horizontal sync. So, how exactly does it work? We have this inverter, which means the flip flops actually clocked on the negative edge of M1 bar. Normally, IO rec's high, and in its normal state, the Q bar output from the leftmost flip flop will be high as well. This feeds into the middle flip flop, which is clocked by the M1 cycle, and its output will be high also. This feeds into our third flip flop. At the start of the next fetch cycle, we get a negative edge on M1. The rightmost Q output goes high. This feeds back to the first flip flop, which has no effect on its state, which means this circuit configuration continues no matter how many M1 cycles we go through. Then, as part of the interrupt acknowledge sequence, IO rec's asserted. This is the set input to the leftmost flip flop, so its Q bar output instantly goes to zero. But IO rec's only low for about one clock cycle, so it'll return to being high without a negative edge on M1. The leftmost flip flop's now in a state where its Q bar output will be low. Keep in mind that our CPU M1 cycle's been inverted. So these flip flops will latch on the negative edge of M1. This occurs as part of the fetch cycle for our decrement C instruction located at 39 hexadecimal. The zero on the input gets transferred to the output of the middle flip flop. Then, as we fetch the jump instruction at location 3A hexadecimal, we clock the rightmost flip flop and its output goes zero. So this represents the start of our horizontal sync period. At the same time, it also resets our leftmost flip flop. So Q bar goes back to being high. At the start of the fetch for the next instruction, which is the pop instruction, the output of the middle flip flop goes high, while the output of the rightmost flip flop stays at zero, so we're still within horizontal sync at this stage. Note that this could either be the pop DE or the pop HL instruction depending on which pathway we take, but either way, both take 10 clock cycles. At the start of fetch for the next instruction, which is either the return or decrement instruction, the output on the rightmost flip flop goes high, and that's the end of horizontal sync. This means, no matter which pathway we take, horizontal sync will be low for the 10 clock cycles of the jump instruction, and the 10 clock cycles for the pop instruction. On the ZX80 at least, sync is low for 20 clock cycles no matter what. Interestingly, the rightmost flip flop is also controlled by vertical sync. So, when V sync goes low, the output of this circuit goes low as well. This also means that during vertical sync, we can trigger this circuit as many times as we want through IO rec, and it'll have no impact on the output. In fact, this is how we perform the reads of the keyboard during vertical sync without upsetting the sync signal. Speaking of which, the next part of the schematic I want to look at is the keyboard circuit. This is controlled by the in instruction, but it's a little more complex than I mentioned previously. While the in instruction itself only refers to an 8 bit port number, the contents of the B register will simultaneously be output on the upper 8 address lines. So, Sir Clive and his team use these upper 8 bits to select the row of the keyboard. Now, he used a set of diodes here. But they're not actually necessary if only one key is being pressed. So why have them? After all, they're just connected to a weak pull up on the other side. Well, we know that Sir Clive wouldn't even pay for eight low lead diodes if he didn't have to. The problem occurs when we press two keys together, say Shift and A. Now, this is a valid operation, but without diodes, 
will short the address lines A8 and A9 together, which is bad. The software is configured so that during the in instruction, only one of the upper eight address lines will be low. So, if an appropriate key is pressed, then one of the corresponding data lines will go low. This goes through a tri state buffer back to our CPU data bus. This buffer is enabled by the in instruction when A0 is low as well. For our build, I've used a 74HC245 buffer to feed the signal back to the data bus. Very graciously, fellow YouTuber iNimble Sloth put his ZX81 keyboard printed circuit board and keycap design on GitHub. I downloaded these and followed the instructions, and it worked precisely as advertised. It looks great. I'll use this as my main keyboard, but I'm only shooting for a ZX80 at this stage, so some of the keys will be wrong. All right, I think we're ready now. I've added the VSync circuit and the keyboard interface. Now let's see if it works. Surprisingly, it didn't actually explode. So, let's look at what's going on. We have this repeating line of Ks which confused me a bit at first. If you think you know what's going on, stop here and drop your theory in the comments. This is a bit of an annoying bug. I've been through the Z80 user manual from Zilog, and it says that during halt, the halt line goes low and the CPU executes no ups to maintain memory refresh. Then, deeper in the fine print, it says that each cycle is a normal fetch cycle, except the data received from the memory is ignored, and a no of instruction is forced internally to the CPU. If we look at the breadboard build, we know that the halt instructions at location 8010, but during halt, it continuously reads from 8011 until it's interrupted. So, the problem is that I haven't included the halt bar signal into the no of generator enable. And I also use this signal to blank the screen. So, during this row of Ks, the Z80 is continually fetching the data for this K on the next line. I add in halt bar, and it works fine. When I first looked at the original schematic diagram, I wondered why this halt signal was connected. It wasn't completely obvious, but now I know. The next problem is that K isn't inverted. That's what this part of the circuit here does. We can see an RS latch, which is set by bit 7 of the data. The output of the latch goes to an exclusive OR gate, which inverts the data out of the shift register. Let's hook this up. Excellent, although there's still a problem. The K character is out by one scan line relative to the inverse signal. I think this means the reset for the line counter isn't quite right, but I'll worry about that later. I'm on a roll, so let's hook up the keyboard and see if I can type in a program. We can see the screen flickering as I type, and this is the expected behaviour for a ZX80. And it works. I'm really pleased with the progress. The ZX80 appears to be working, and we've gone over the schematic in fine detail. In the next video, let's see if we can upgrade it to be a ZX81. I'll see you then.